Welcome to Valpo FUMC Online. We're honored you've chosen to spend some time with us today. Over the next week, we have some special services in person in downtown Valparaiso. But we also have two special services coming up here online over the next week. We will live stream our 8 p.m. Christmas Eve service on Christmas Eve. So that's right here at 8 p.m. on Christmas Eve. We'll also live stream our Christmas Day service at 10 o'clock a.m. And we'll do the same thing a week later on New Year's Day. That means instead of pre-recording the services like we currently do for Sundays, we will live stream right from our church sanctuary so you'll be able to see the service as it happens live in the church building. So we hope you'll join us on Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, and New Year's Day right here online if you're not available to attend in person. A couple of years ago, I came across a video that tells a powerful story of the good news. Take a look at this. My mama told me something when I was growing up that has forever changed my life. She played the piano at our little church at 3rd and Pine Street for 37 years. She tried to teach me to play the piano, <laughs> but I wasn't very good. She would teach me the names of the notes, what a major key is, what a minor key is. She tried to teach me musical theory, but I was just bored. Then, one day, she told me that the best news in the world is found by playing a simple scale on the piano. I had no idea what she meant, so she told me to play an eight-note scale. So I did. I said, how is that good news? And she said I played it incorrectly and that I needed to play it the other way. So I did. Again, I said, how is that good news? And she said I played it the right way, but I needed to add the pauses. The pauses, she said, the pauses. Add them on the first, second, fourth, sixth, seventh, and last note. Now, I was frustrated and said, how can eight notes with random pauses be the best news in the world? Then I got up, walked away, and went outside. Frankly, I didn't care what she was talking about. I didn't like playing the piano anyway. Well, years later, my mama got sick and passed away. As I was thinking about her, I remembered what she told me about the piano. Not only that, I still remember the notes she told me to pause. The first, second, fourth, sixth, seventh, and last note. So I sat down at her piano and played the scale with the pauses. That's when I realized the good news she was talking about. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. That's the good news. What a powerful story that reminds us of the most, the most important and powerful story of all time. When Jesus came to earth, to save the world from sin. Today is the last day of our teaching series, The Story of Christmas According To. In week one, we looked at the Christmas story according to Adam and Eve. 
In week two, it was the Christmas story according to Moses. Last week, it was the Christmas story according to Paul. And today, it's the Christmas story according to eternity. Here's Pastor Kevin. Well, this time of year is always interesting to me and a little bit intriguing, but many probably not for the same reasons that they're intriguing for you. I'm interested in the commercials. For example, I'm sure it happens to all kinds of people where they walk out of their house on Christmas morning and there's a $120,000 sports car sitting in their driveway with a red bow on it. Doesn't that happen to you? Never happened to me. I've never even known anybody that that happens to. The other day, my wife and I were had the TV on, and that commercial came on with a young couple walking through the snow. And I asked her, honey, if, if I give you a $400 puppy for Christmas, will you buy me an $80,000 truck? <laughs> yeah, she's still laughing about that. My question is, does any of this actually happen in real life? But when you stop and think about it, this is really what Christmas is all about. No, I don't mean a new vehicle in your driveway. Christmas is about God doing the impossible through the improbable. In our mind's eye, many of us uh, think of the Christmas story when we sing the words to Silent Night, Holy Night. All is calm, all is is bright. And the scene that we envision as we sing these words are a very quiet scene of a young couple surrounded by some shepherds, maybe a few animals, quietly and serenely gathered around a baby lying in a manger. Well, during this time, during Advent, we've been exploring the story of Christmas from different biblical perspectives. I want to thank Pastor Kathy for doing such a great job uh, with Paul's version of Christmas last week. And today we're going to wrap this up as we come to the fourth, fourth week of Advent. And we look at a book that maybe we hadn't thought of before, the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. And what we find is Revelation's depiction of the Christmas story is anything but a silent night. Revelation tells the story from the perspective of heaven, a story where all is not calm, all is not bright. For here we find the story that is of an epic battle. Satan knows that the Messiah is coming into the world to free people from his grip. And to this day, this battle remains. Eugene Peterson, who wrote a very popular version of the Bible called The Message, said about this story in Revelation 12, he, he said, this is not the nativity story that we grew up with, but it is the nativity story all the same. And so if you have your Bible with you, open it up to Revelation 12. It's the very last book of the Bible. I don't know what version you're reading from, but I'm drawn to the message for this story. So join me in hearing the Christmas story according to Revelation 12. I'm going to read the entire chapter. And this is Eugene Peterson's version called The Message. A great sign appeared in heaven. 
A woman dressed all in sunlight, standing on the moon and crowned with twelve stars. She was giving birth to a child and cried out in the pain of childbirth. And then another sign alongside the first, a huge and fiery dragon. It had seven heads and ten horns, a crown on each of the seven heads. With one flick of its tail, it knocked a third of the stars from the sky and dumped them on earth. The dragon crouched before the woman in childbirth, poised to eat up the child when it came. The woman gave birth to a son who will shepherd all nations with an iron rod. Her son was seized and placed safely before God on his throne. The woman herself escaped to the desert to a place of safety prepared by God. All comforts provided her for 1,260 days. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but were no match for Michael. They were cleared out of heaven, not a sign of them left. The great dragon, ancient serpent, the one called devil, and Satan, the one who led the whole earth astray, thrown out. And all his angels, thrown out with him, thrown down to the earth, Then I heard a strong voice out of heaven saying, Salvation and power are established. Kingdom of our God, authority of his Messiah. The accuser of our brothers and sisters thrown out, who accused them day and night before God. They defeated him through the blood of the Lamb and the bold word of their witness. They weren't in love with themselves. They were willing to die for Christ. So rejoice, O heavens, and all who live there, but doom to earth and sea. For the devils come down on you with both feet. He's had a great fall. He's wild and raging with anger. He hasn't much time, and he knows it. When the dragon saw he'd been thrown to the earth, he went after the woman who had given birth to the man-child. The woman was given wings of a great eagle to fly to a place in the desert, to be kept in safety and comfort for a time and times and a half, safe and sound from the serpent. The serpent vomited a river of water to swamp and drown her, but earth came to her help, swallowing the water the dragon spewed from its mouth. Helpless with rage, the dragon raged at the woman, then went off to make war with the rest of her children, the children who keep God's commands and hold firm to the witness of Jesus. And so what we learn is Dr. Peterson is right. In this version of the Christmas story, there is no baby in a manger, no shepherds rejoicing. There's not even wise men bringing gifts. There are angels but they're not singing. We have here in Revelation 12, three main characters. We have a beautiful woman clothed, standing on the moon, a male child, and thirdly, a great fiery red dragon who stands ready to devour, to eat the sun, who as verse five points out, will shepherd all the nations. Now, as with every story in the Bible, we need to bring some context to Revelations 12 to make sense of it. Now, this book of the Bible, Revelation, is likely the most studied and discussed book in the Bible. There's so much information out there. Even for the Bible itself, Revelation is unique. It was written by the Apostle John, the same writer of three other books that bear his name in the New Testament. Now, by the time John writes Revelation, he is an old man. He is the final survivor of the 12 original disciples, and he has been banished to an island in the Aegean Sea known as Patmos. It's still there today. It's just off the coast of Ephesus. He's been banished here because he refuses to stop preaching the basic gospel message to the world that Jesus is Lord. He got in a lot of trouble for that. 
It was here on this island of Patmos that John received a series of visions that we now know as the book of Revelation. And it includes the one that we're exploring today. Now, the first 11 chapters of this book are filled with signs and pictures that symbolize things in the world and and about who God is. But in chapter 12, we read something and we hear a story that sounds familiar. Now, it's interesting to me that John's gospel of the four gospels, John's does not include the birth of Jesus. But in Revelation, we find a Christmas story written not from Earth's perspective, but from Heaven's perspective. In the very first verse of chapter 12, Jesus pulls the curtain back and reveals to John a woman dressed all in sunlight, standing on the moon and crowned with 12 stars. Now, Revelations, if you're not aware, it's full of metaphors. It's it's full of symbolism. And so the woman in John's vision, it was originally thought may be Mary, because a few verses later, it it says she has given birth to a child and cried out in the pain of childbirth. But in Revelation, this woman represents something else. This woman symbolizes the, the church. She is wearing a crown of 12 stars. Later in chapter 12, John describes her as being persecuted by the devil. Of course, the woman is is not Mary, but she represents the Christian church on earth. She represents the sum total of all the believers of Jesus throughout all time. The 12 stars represent the 12 tribes of Israel, as well as the 12 apostles. This unnamed woman represents every believer going back to Adam and Eve and also represents every Old Testament prophet up to every believer in Jesus today. Yes, even you and I. Now, the prophet Isaiah wrote over 400 years before the birth of Jesus. He wrote, unto us a child is born. Now, behind the scenes of Mary giving birth in a stable in Bethlehem, heaven was celebrating the birth of the family of God, a different kind of birth. And so from heaven's perspective, we find this great battle. All was not calm. All was not bright. Verse 3 introduces the third party of this cosmic drama a huge and fiery dragon. It had seven heads and ten horns, a crown on each of the seven heads. Now, as we find, the dragon, of course, represents Satan. And in the book of Revelations, we find that behind the scenes of the nativity, behind the scenes of the birth of Jesus, Satan is there. Now, in Revelation the the devil is depicted appropriately as a very powerful creature. Did you did you hear this verse? With one flick of its tail, it knocked a third of the stars from the sky and dumped them on earth. And so what was the prince of darkness doing behind the scenes at the birth of Jesus? Something very scary, we find that the dragon crouched before the woman in childbirth, poised to eat up the child when it came. This is not your father's Christmas story. Revelation tells a different kind of Christmas story. It should come as no surprise to any of us that Satan knows exactly who this child is. And so behind the scenes of Jesus' birth, while we saw the serene scene in a stable just outside of Bethlehem, Satan was doing everything he could to thwart God's plan for our salvation. And he still does that today. Maybe that's why when Jesus was born, there were so many angels involved in celebrating his birth. When you read the Bible, Satan's presence is not always obvious, but he is always behind the scenes. 
I thought the writers of the movie of uh, The Passion of the Christ picked up on, on this theme as a dark satanic figure is in the background of almost every scene. Here's the thing. God's plan cannot and will not be thwarted. God's plan will not be stopped. The common summary of the book of Revelation is, is always found in, in two words. If you want a two-word summary of Revelations, it's God wins. And this is especially true here in Revelations 12. John's vision includes the fact that she gave birth to a son who will shepherd all nations with an iron rod. Other versions of this story refer to it as an iron scepter. However, the message is always the same. This child will rule. This child will be king, but not just any king. He would be a king unlike any other king. Remember Moses' words from a few weeks ago. This king will come from the people. The victory of Jesus is summed up in, in verse 5. Her son was seized and placed safely before God on his throne. Now, again, this is not the story that we're going to hear on Christmas Eve. In this story, John reveals a different perspective. There is great evil highlighted by the devil. However, here's, here's the big but, but there is also great victory and great hope. These two themes not only exist behind the scenes of Christmas today, but behind the scenes of our lives. Every day of our lives, from heaven's perspective, there is the presence of great evil, but there is also the presence of great hope. This is why the Apostle Paul wrote this line to the Ephesians. He said, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The devil is still working behind the scenes today, doing anything and everything necessary to cause you to turn away from Jesus. Look at the concluding verse of chapter 12. Helpless with rage. After this great cosmic battle, helpless with rage, the dragon raged at the woman, then went off to make war with the rest of her children. The children who keep God's commands and hold firm to the witness of Jesus. Now, you don't need a seminary degree to figure this out. The dragon is coming after you. The dragon is coming after me. The dragon is coming after the church. Remember who the woman represents? Not Mary. Remember that the woman represents the church, the Christian church today. So it's significant that the dragon went off to make war on the rest of her children. And we still see this today. Behind the scenes of our lives and in our churches today, great evil is at work. But behind the scenes, there is also great good and great power. Remember this, that God wins. The child in the manger, this Jesus that much of the world ignores, and even so-called authorities in the church today discount, this child is the Savior, is Christ the Lord, is Emmanuel, God with us, is the Messiah. And if you will let him in, Jesus still takes the evil in your life, all that Satan can throw at you, and does something great with it. See, this is the real story of Christmas that God still does the impossible through the improbable. The themes of Christmas remain. Great evil and great good. We find these same, same themes behind the scenes on Good Friday. Great evil, but three days later, 
God wins. You know, I'm, I'm recording this during the midst of a very busy week for me. And for us here at the church, I will be presiding at three funerals in, in four days. And, and I'm not complaining about that. Sometimes it happens in the church, and it's just one of those weeks. But of the three funerals, the third is, is going to be the most difficult not because of who he is, but because Sean is, is younger than me. And so allow me to conclude this series and this talk today with the words of a dying man. For as long as I've known Sean, he has been dealing with cancer. But his focus has always been on his family and on his faith. His family knows this line because he repeated it enough to him, especially in the last few weeks of his life. He, he said, my faith is greater than my fear. You see, Sean was given the gift of time. Time to tie up the loose ends. Time to tell the people around him how much he loved them. And so when I arrived at his bedside last Thursday afternoon, I found a very different Sean uh, from the one that I knew. Instead of a strong and smiling and vibrant man, I found a weak, stationary, and cancer-ridden, but still smiling, Sean. And he confessed that he was ready, but yes, that he was afraid. But in the end, he, he repeated the same line, my faith is greater than my fear. And so this Christmas, as you face your own challenges, as you face great evil, along with great good, what is going on behind the scenes of your life? Is your faith greater than your fear? God still wants you to come to him, to overcome your fears, and just say yes to this child. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, thank you for reminding us today about all that happened behind the scenes of that first Christmas. Help us, Lord, to realize that this great evil is still evident and happening in our lives today and in our world. But thank you, Lord, that you are still fighting for us, that there is great good as well in the world today. And so, Lord, we pray for your help. May our faith truly be greater than our fear, as we realize that not only is the devil very real, real but we can live our lives with hope and confidence because you are very real as well and very present. You are the great Emmanuel, God with us. And so Lord, send your angels during this time to those who are struggling, to those who are in grief, to those who have turned away from you. Be Emmanuel, God with us, Lord. Thank you. Amen. Well, my wish for you is that you have a merry and blessed Christmas. Here's Pastor Mark. Jesus came to give us the peace, hope, joy, and love that we need so that our faith can be greater than our fear. Your challenges are no match for God, and neither is your sin. Don't give up. Jesus is here ready to lift you up and carry you through the darkest nights of your life. All you have to do is surrender to the Savior who was born to a mother He created. God did miracles then. He still does them today. Keep believing.